Hello and welcome to the Black Tower. I'm the Sorcerer Armand Sewell. And tonight I want to bring to you a friend from Facebook, Freddy. Freddy, what's up, man? Nothing much, man. Nothing much. Glad to be here. Hell yeah, it's good to have you here, man. Uh, you know, I, I see you do your live stream sometimes on Facebook, you know, and, and some of your artwork and stuff uh, here lately you've been posting. I like that, man. That's pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. It's become, I mean, I've always been an artist, but it's really become my passion recently when I got into painting. I've been using a lot of uh, gouache and uh, acrylic paints. And uh, I like to incorporate some occult elements and I like to do similar abstract visions of the world that I see and the world that I see it becoming. I hear you. Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, you and I have in common is uh, Luciferianism. You know? Yep, absolutely. Well, you know, for for tonight's subject or whatever, you know, let's talk about some Luc let, Let's talk Luciferianism. Let's talk Lucifer. Let's talk about the the heights and the depths and all that. I'm gonna let you start this off. Your idea, your version of Luciferianism. What is it? For me, Luciferianism is based on the Hellenic Greek uh, mystery school of Luciferianism, where it was the bearer of light, Lux Fair, who brought sacred wisdom. It was represented through the Promethean story, um, where Prometheus defied the gods to bring wisdom to man, sacred wisdom to man. And what when it was passed to me through Reverend Robert Stills, which he was the founder of the Church of Lucifer, um, the way it was better explained to me is that Luciferianism at its core is a veneration and acceptance of the attributes or characteristics of Lucifer himself, along with um, other deities that over the years have, have sort of taken different masks. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's funny you're talking about Prometheus. On my own channel, I talk about, uh, you know, uh, co co editing has got this, you know, steal fire from the gods and stuff, but on my channel, I'm all about some Promethean stealing fire from the gods, but there's, but there's a concept, uh, you know, that I keep pushing and I keep trying to, you know, point this out, is that we're not stealing the fire. The fire has already been stolen, has already been given, we are already instilled with it. This is that Luciferian gnosis that we all already have, we just have only to claim it. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe the fire is already within all of us. That's the black flame that burns that sort of ignites and permeates and motivates all of us to to aspire to be more, to do more, and to be better individuals for ourselves. Oh yeah. You know, your your idea, your concept of the black flame, what is it? The black flame to to me and to those in the Church of Lucifer is that it's uh, if a flame, a burning passion that's within all of us to strive to greater heights of knowledge and gnosis um, and to apply it to our own life and to apply it to multiple avenues of our life. Like, as I was mentioning um, on my, my page a little bit ago, um, my art is an inspiration and a reflection of Luciferianism. Um, I'm also a martial artist, so my martial arts is an expression of myself, but it's also an expression of Luciferianism. Everything that I do is is sort of guided by the black flame within. It's not just uh, a passion as much as it is an all-consuming force. Dude, I can feel that in my heart center. And I think the reason why is because, you know, that, that speaks to me. Uh, in my own, uh, in my own workings with me, it was the, uh, it was from Michael W. Ford's uh, Luciferian Witchcraft with the workings of Armin from the Yatuk the Noi that started the whole entire thing with the uh, application of uh, Lilith Aja being used, being the one who awakened Armin from his sleep and his slumber unto lust. Now, a lot of people, when they think lust, the first thing they're thinking of is the member between their legs and that. That's not lust. That's, that's the low vibration lust. But the type of lust that Lilith Hage awoke within Armin, yes, that was its root, but, but the true causality of it, the true thing that actually happened 
was the awakening of the flame within him. And when I was uh, working, when I was doing the workings of this, that's when the black flame came alive, came, came to life within myself. And that's when I came to understand, holy crap, this shit is way deeper than just, you know, saying some words, doing a ritual, you know, a sex rite and all this other stuff that's involved in it or that can be involved in it. Uh, you know, stuff like this. The gnosis that I obtained, that I gained from actually taking, taking time out of my life and actually going through the ritual and not just the ritual, but like I was, like it was, uh, like, a, like I was self-taught to understand is that when you're going to do a work, study the work a lot, way before you do it so that you understand the different correspondences, what they represent, what they mean. So that when you go to do the work, it has a deeper connection to you. And so that's what I did. And when that black flame awakened, I understood all of a sudden I had a new zeal for life. And, you know, I've always been the glass half full guy. So, you know, it kind of like elevated that to like the 10th degree. Um, the black flame. Yeah, it, 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 it's more than just a, 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 a lust like for, you know, sex. It's more than primordial thought. It's more like a lust for greater spirit, a lust for greater knowledge. Oh, yeah. You know, and something else I'd like to throw out there, and I want to get your take on this or whatever. Okay. So, so it started off that way, and, you know, just a black flame, and I kept thinking, well, you know, there's got to be a being behind this black flame. Well, then I went to working with uh, Jen, and I was introduced to Iblis, and Iblis being the black and flame. And ever since working with Iblis as being the black and flame, and working with Iblis, uh, the understanding of what all you can do with it became deeper than just, oh, I'm a black and flame, you know, that I am the living flame, uh, which surpasses flesh and spirit. Uh, and, and this is all known as according with working with Iblis, of course. Uh, but anyway, so I was working through it, and I realized something. Everything that the black flame touches, it changes. It transmutes it to its highest and best form. Could you agree with that or disagree or what are your thoughts? A hundred percent agree with that. Um, the, the, the great thing about it, what a lot of people neglect um, when they move into the, the you know, left-hand path and they start studying the darker aspects of things, is that all of the deities are old. When someone says Satan, they don't necessarily mean, oh, the Judeo-Christian devil, and I'm worshiping, you know, the inverse Bible now. Um, they're, they're talking about older entities that have been taken and demonized by, um, you know, Catholicism and, and in the Bible. Um, when you think of Satan, when I think of Satan anyway, I think of, of Shaitan. I think of Set. And... A, a lot of people, when they think of, of Satan, they just think Satan, the Christian, you know, red man with long horns on the top of his head that's here to tempt Christ for, you know, so many days. And it's like, it's just that that's not anywhere near anything of any great importance to anyone who actually practices any form of darker aspect of magic. And so, yeah, the... the for me, that is exactly what the, the black flame represents. It represents going back to our deepest, most, most primal self and what the primal self truly desires and bringing that out, elevating that to, to new heights of, you know, greatness. When, when somebody does, like we were talking about, um, the holy guardian angel, when someone converses with the holy guardian angel, it's that elevation only can, t can truly manifest through the elevation of the black flame within by applying that, by taking that wisdom and not just knowing the wisdom, but applying that. Yeah. It was really scary with me when I was uh, working with the black flame and working with my HGA. Uh, but before we do that, before I go into that point, I'm coming back to the Satan station. You know, you and I were talking beforehand, you know, where I was talking about, you know, at first it was Satan for me, you know, and I was working through that. And I got all out of, out of that that I could. And then I started working through Satanism uh, and Zephyr, you know, meaning I become, is all that. Uh, and then working working through, through Set was way different. 
working through the set form of say, I'm not gonna lie, it made me a weapon. That whole process just, I mean, I, not that I was filled with violence, but I kind of was. I was filled with this destructive nature of just, you know, destroying the weak aspects of myself. The storm god, the rage. Yeah, and I needed that at the time. And as I was working with the Black Flame, like I said, and then working with my HGA, uh, one day I had the uh, crazy idea of awakening the Black Flame within my HGA. And when I introduced that, that's when my HDA became my holy daemon. That's when it was infused with, with, with its true essence, with its true power of what it could, you know, its potential. Right. Of what it could become. And to this day, I still walk with it. Uh, do you have similar experiences? I mean, what have you done? For, for our sect of Luciferianism, we believe in a, a guardian from the Kako daemons. I don't know if you're familiar with the term Kako oh, I love the Kakadamans. And yeah, exactly. And we believe that that is something that is attached to you. So our holy guardian angel, when it's elevated, that is what it is. It, it is the manifestation of the Kako daemon. Yeah. And so in giving that power and giving that life and giving that the, the black flame, it, it was definitely a lot like that for me. It, it's for me, I work um, exclusively with, specific entities specific energies um i work with lucifer of course i work with some of the other pantheon off and on but there's one that i've always worked with bal zabub and i've always worked with him that, that's always been something i even have a a tattoo oh, that's that i had gotten m many years ago <laughs> And uh, it was even before I knew who um, Beelzebub truly was. I had that tattoo put on my hand. And everybody's like, why the hell would you get a fly with a human head tattooed on you? And it wasn't until a lot of years later that, you know, it sort of uh, made sense to me. But we believe that our Kako daemon is our manifestation of our holy guardian angel. And when that happens, when you finally realize who it is and everything kind of clicks, everything sort of makes sense at that point. It's terrifying, but it's also incredibly empowering. Yeah. It's something that, that the feeling is indescribable, really. It's something that it comes out of you, and it feels like a whole different version of you. Yeah. Like it's it's not you at your low vibration form. It's you at, you know, the, the ascended auto deification, I guess you would call it, um, stage. And uh, it, it's really shocking when, when you first start working with it, when, when it first manifests itself. Oh, yeah. You know, that's... That's funny you say that, because like I've noticed uh, over the years that uh, my holy Damon has like multiple, multiple faces, like seriously. And now I never honestly ever put two and two together on the Kakadamans, you know, being that I, I never put that together, you know. So that's really cool doing this and learning something new. That was that's awesome, because now understanding that I can be like, holy crap, because I don't I don't stop my daemon from doing what what it does because i know for a matter of fact that the trust and the respect and the love and it being who i it being my perfected self my sacred star my sacred self you know why the fuck would i stop it first off you know but that makes a lot of sense concerning vials above now i thought this was interesting uh, <laughs> so i work so i work with the zuzu and Pazuzu was a thing before it was in the Simon Necronomicon, yes, but uh, I used the, uh, the seal and the symbol of, of Pazuzu. Now, Pazuzu is a plague demon. Now, what's funny is that those things that can cause these things can also stop these things. But I want to, for our viewers, and maybe even for you if you didn't know this, you can actually combine Pazuzu and Baal's above together. So... Pazuzu reigns over plagues, diseases, sickness, shit like that is a plague because it's a plague upon mankind, right? Flesh. Now, what you do is you get you get Pazuzu 
to call forth the demon that you know that represents that sickness or that disease and then using baal's above get him to command it forth and out and he usually comes out in the form of a fly or flies just depends and i've been using this for a while and and it's really weird there you you can sit there and you can say oh yeah but there are already flies and you you know how people are and so forth and so on and disbelievers and all this that and the other but when you see it actually happen and you can feel it you know it's a, it's a thing have you ever have you ever thought of combining the two and using them like that to remove sickness that would be that's actually really interesting i've worked with uh mesopotamian spirits in in the past i live right near the um penn university museum which has the second largest collection of uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian antiquities outside of their, their mother countries and the Museum of Chicago. Um, it, it's got a huge basement that has actual um, pylons and pillars from Egypt. It has uh, all of the, the um, small cuneiform tablets. And these things are small. They were yeah. fairly small tablets but there's hundreds of them on display, including the first beer recipe. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Go ahead. I've never thought of actually incorporating uh, Pazuzu or his brother Hamwawa into, um, into one of my workings like that. That's a pretty interesting idea. Well, let me go a little bit more in depth because you brought up Hamwawa, his brother. Where one goes, the other is. One is thunder and one is lightning. Seriously, it's really weird. And I'm not trying to quote a Imagine Dragon Song. I'm just saying it's really weird how they work together in tandem. Okay, so if you take the uh, seal that's in the Simon Necronomicon of Humwawa, first thing you're going to notice is the squiggly lines. Well, those squiggly lines actually represent a physical labyrinth that you're supposed to walk physically to be able to open up the way the whole time you're chanting Humwawa's name. And Humwawa is the guardian of the cedar forest, right? Well, the cedar forest used to be a symbol of a sacred space and an opening into a magical place, a magical plane or place where spirits dwell, because it was said that within forests lie many ancient spirits. Right. Well, you use Umwawa, you walk as you walk as a labyrinth, which the number of rings is eight times, so you go counter so you go clockwise eight times to the center, calling forth finally. Once you said Mwawa's name, as you at each ring you pass saying his name, you come to the center, then you call forth Pazuzu. And usually what's really weird is even if there's not a storm or anything like that, I have had a uh, dry thunder pop in the middle of a day doing this particular working, calling forth Pazuzu. And it's really freaky, like you'll know when he comes. You know, he has he has a thing showing up in form and force. But uh, have you ever seen the statues of Pazuzu? Yeah, I've seen the statue of Pazuzu. Well, for our audience and for you, allow me to tell you that there are, that in the ancient of days, there weren't just words and symbols that they used. There were postures that they assumed to be able to better connect with that particular deity. And so it's the, it's the right hand up like this, the left hand down, if you'll pay attention to it. That's its invocation, and then automatically you feel the wings, and you you know you got the you got the monster's face, you know, the genitalia of a of a writhing snake. And right, a lot like um the Baphomet, the the Levy Baphomet, right hand up, left hand down. Exactly, it's 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 a posture of how you assume the god form of these ancient ancient demons and ancient gods. Not really demons. I hate to say demons because I started using the Greek word demon. And I, and I just equate it to all of them because all in all, it's, everything is a spirit one way or another, you know. Right. But but once you've done the Pazuzu and you've done this, then you then you are acting as Pazuzu, okay? Now, this is very important towards what I was telling you earlier. So once you've assumed the form and the posture of Pazuzu, then call upon Beelzebub. Baal's about to be able to command the demon that's in the sick person and get it and all above like i said will get the spirit to leave in the form of a fly now there's a lot more to it than that you know you gotta have like a special water mix and you've got to have a pine cone for this act but 
That's the general uh, exorcism. And that stuff, you're not going to find that in the book. That, you know, I'm very thankful the stuff I've learned is just like off the hook. But there are also things I've practiced. I've put into practice. Well, did you know that all these things are in the Simon Necronomicon? And then it's so weird that people don't know that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, because all they read is the whole, these are the abominations and they should never be worked with, blah, blah, blah. And then you and I are sitting here having a Luciferian conversation. And, you know, and there is nothing denied to us. Right. You know, because we, you know, mankind are the children of the gods. And they watch over their children. You know, because we're gods. You know, we're just young, dumb gods, if you want to look at it that way. Ignorant, maybe, if you want to be kinder. Uh, and Lucy, right. what do you find? And the funny thing is, I hear so many people talk bad about the Simon Necronomicon. I've actually met, like I was talking to you about, I've actually met the, the, the couple that um, took part in writing the uh, original Simon Necronomicon. They literally took about 75% of it from the Enuma Elish. That makes the sense. ancient Mesopotamia Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Flood, the Deluge. So a lot of it is actually straight from ancient Mesopotamia. Yeah. You can, you can definitely tell that back during the time that it was written or whatever, that they were using uh, modern day uh, uh, witchcraft, Wiccan rites to put it together. I mean, you can tell that. You, you can tell that influence is there. Modern influence is there. But the names, the symbols, the words, yeah, those, somebody didn't just come up with those out of their hat. Exactly. And, and that's the whole thing that, that always gets me when I hear people who are new to the occult and they're like, oh, the Necronomicon's not real. It's not real. It is real because the Necronomicon by Simon was actually easily 75 to 80 percent taken directly from Mesopotamian doctrines and documents. Um, you can read the, the full Enuma Elish online and then read the Simon Necronomicon and you're like, the old ones, it, it's all there. Um, Nurgle, Kingu, um, it's, it's all there in yeah, the book. Yeah. yeah. Tiamat. Yeah. It, it, it's all there. Pazuzu, Hamwawa. Uh, it, the thing is, people are too into trying to debunk everything. They're more into trying to be right and prove everyone else wrong than they are to actually do genuine research and, and just read and to actually have, have studied it. But I'm a nerd. I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm a nerd. Same here. Uh, but the reason I think that we kind of got off on this for just a minute, and I want to clear this up for the audience, this isn't a video on uh, the Simon Economic Problem, it's a video on Luciferianism, is the fact that had it not been for the gnosis that I received from and of Lucifer, and with the, within the black flame and stuff, it expands your knowledge and your understanding. And when it does, you start to understand things that nobody's wrote yet, or the sands of time have destroyed, obliterated, or been lost. You know, and it, so it always comes right back to Lucifer, you know, the light bearer. And light always just represented consciousness, you know. And I think that there's so many people that misunderstand that. Right. Lucifer is all about individual. It's all about Lucifer is all about the individual um, raising consciousness, raising vibration, raising your awareness and knowledge and having personal gnosis. It's all about finding out more about yourself as well as the world around you and the spirit. And it, it, it's Luciferianism isn't, you know, pure rebellion like you would find in, in uh Satanism, where it's all about, you know, rebellion and, and all of that. Lucifer is the rebel, don't, don't get me wrong, but he's a rebel spiritually. He's a rebel mentally. He's a rebel in every way you can possibly think. He's not just, you know, pretty much Bender from Futurama. To hell with God, I'll make my own heaven with blackjack and hookers. You know, that, that, that's not Lucifer, you know. It, it, it's a much more elevated concept. You know, you know, that whole that whole thing there with Lucifer being the rebel. Uh, I got to say, anybody who's ever worked closely with that current or that force or that being and trying to emulate it, 
the very first thing that's going to happen, and and I don't know, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes not so subtle. You will rebel against the order that has been set upon you on this earth. You will you you will rebel against anything that tells you this is how you must feel, this is how you must think, this is how you must do. No, you need to shut the fuck up, sit the fuck down, and let me do what I'm doing. Because I have just as equal right as you do. And I mean, and that's that's the experience I've had with Lucifer and with the uh, whole uh, Shatan right behind it. it. It's it just empowers and overflows. Like I have an infernal trinity that I uh, that I employ. Everything uh, Shatan for the might, the strength of the power of my flesh and my blood. You know, my heart rising up. Just you know, this is pure raw strength and power. This is the might of will to everything to Lucifer. And Lucifer is the might and power of my mind, of my consciousness, of my psyche, of, you know, destroying the boundaries, destroying, you know, which holds me back, uh, which has been set upon by others, you know, like, like I was talking about with the social norm. And then, and then you come to the black flame, and the black flame, you know, is the incubator. It's the thing that sits there pulsing and just giving life and power and force to everything that you fucking do. And it transmutes, changes it, and it makes it into its highest elevated form. You have right. a thing. That's one of the things that really gets me is that, like Aleister Crowley put it, the ultimate goal of magic is total freedom, total liberation. And the only way to do that is to rebel against just about everything. Yeah. You have to rebel against, you know, spiritual yeah. law. You have to rebel against unnatural um, feelings. You have to rebel against almost everything. It's just like when I hear somebody who claims to be on the left-hand path and they hate somebody because they're different, it's absolutely ridiculous because all you're doing is saying that your will is more important in some way than them executing their will, them being their true self them having their absolute freedom. Yeah. And and that's where people that are steadfast on the left-hand path that are, you know, especially people that are new on the left-hand path that don't really know any better, that have only been, you know, five years and under, what they really don't understand is that, that you do you and you be the best you you can possibly be for you. But don't impede on another person doing that same exact thing because they do it different. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I say that a lot. You know, and it's interesting that the new people upon the left hand path, and there's nothing wrong with this, I'm just pointing this out. They sit there and they got the rebelling thing down pat, but they never go past that. They're still stuck in the hate space. Uh, the hate, the hate is supposed to, you're supposed to let it fade because a new being is born within you in this process, you know, and, uh, and it's interesting that it's up to those of us who have been here longer, you know, to try and help them if they'll let us help them. Now, there's a lot that, you know, they think they got the bull by the horns, let them do it, you know, you go right ahead, Cupcake, I like how you doing this, you seem to have it down pat, let's see what you make of it. Because there are some people where I'm sitting there going, oh, this is going to end bad. And then I'm sitting there going, holy shit, what the fuck? <laughs> and so I quit. I quit worrying about this younger generation. I just like, you know, you got to have patience, got to have patience, got to have patience. And then, it's, and then that patience reminds me that, you know, if spirit wasn't the exact same fucking way, man, would we be fucked? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's just, uh, Aleister Crowley said, every man and every woman is a star. I hate to keep going back to the man, but his quotes are, are very prolific. Yeah. Every man and every woman is a star. Well, what is a star when you think about it? It's an individual light burning at its own pace, burning its own fuel, burning itself. Yeah. That's the black flame and all of us are entitled to burn. All of us are entitled to to be engulfed by it and to become whatever we, whatever the hell or whoever the hell we want to be. Yeah. And the thing I like to add right after I say, every man and every woman is a star from Alvel Legis. The very next words I like to say, 
O oh man, does thou not know thou art of God? You have to claim that shit. You have to, you know I mean? You have to feel and know that shit. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And the, the newer, I hope a lot of newer occultists are watching this because I don't have any animosity or anger or anything, but they really need to, to learn what self-examination is because that's basically the key to the kingdom right there, self-examination. It's exploring the shadow self, as, as Jung put it. Um, it, it, it's learning the, the darker parts of yourself and not just exploring it, but accepting it, coming to love it, coming to, to understand what it is, to understand that it's just a part of you. And if you can accept yourself and love yourself, then it's possible to apply that same thing to everything that you do. Hell yeah. You know, I like, I have a lot of friends. I mean, a lot of friends that are in the occult and, you know, and I'm really close with every single one of them. Sit and shoot the shit, comment on their post, you know, all of a sudden the other video chat with them, you know, do interviews with them and all this other stuff. And it seems like every time I do an interview with somebody, I'm like, you know, dude, that's the shit, you know. But this is another one of those times where, you know, it's just, you know, this is the first time you and I have had a chance to video chat, but it is so amazing, you know, from the time we were talking before we started recording till we, start, till we started recording, the fact that, you know, we have the exact same influences. And and I, I, th I think it's strange that, you know, we do have our similarities and we also have our differences at the same time because though, though we have similar takes from it, we each have our own path because we are each our own stalls. And, and that should never stop us from being able to sit there and conversate with one another. It should be, you know, oh, I've got all the truths and you've got dead shit. You know, I don't buy into that. I never have, never will. Uh, I have a saying here at the Black Tower, leave your ego at the door because ego is not consciousness. Right, like uh, I forget exactly who it was, but a, a really famous Buddhist said, if you meet a man on the road who claims to be the Buddha, kill him. And what he meant by that was, Basically, the person who says they have all the truth and they'll teach you is the biggest bullshitter because they don't have all the truth about you. They can't tell you about you. They can't help you to explore you any more than you can help your dog to learn how to type on a typewriter. Yeah. Each individual is going to be an individual. Even two people who have all of the same background are still going to be an individual. They're still going to be different. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I have a particular favorite. You, you quote that. I'm going to quote Marilyn Manson. Dear God, if you were alive, you know we'd kill you. And it's... Uh, <laughs> now, whatever the fuck Manson was trying to say yeah. you know, might be a bit different than the way I took it. But I take inspiration from anywhere and everywhere because it's just true. You know, even if, you know, if you were to meet the Buddha, kill him, you know, take that sound advice. Uh, and, you know, and no, I'm not saying go out and kill somebody calling to be God. Please don't be that stupid or ignorant. That's not what either one of us are saying. Um, that, and I think that with the Manson thing, I think, uh, I think the reason I like it so much is because it's true. If God were, if, like, let's say Jesus came back, which that's never going to fucking happen, you know, that's their popsicle dream. Good luck. If 2,000 years, it ain't happened, and I come back. The uh, consciousness might still exist, but, yeah, dude ain't got here, he ain't coming back. But that's not a here nor there. But the thing is, is that if he did, man, he would be mugged, robbed, and shot in certain areas. You know what I'm saying? I mean, something would happen. And so it makes sense to me that if God was alive, yeah, you know, if, it, if he wasn't taken by the government and tested upon and ultimately killed for his power and his secrets and blah, 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 it would be some random encounter on the street that got his ass. You know, and I don't know what a fucking automobile was, bam, ran the fuck over. I'm just being silly here, but it's just true. And the funny thing about that is everybody says the second coming of Christ Christ was supposedly born. That would be the first coming. He died and resurrected. That would be the second coming. So what they're actually waiting for is the third helping. 
Well, what they want is they want physical manifestation so that they can have proof that their religion is valid. Here's the thing. No such thing. Guess what? They live in a they live in a popsicle dream world and they've got to deal with it because just I, I like how you pointed that out, you know, the resurrection was the second coming and they missed that. You know, it's like they come to my door, have you found Jesus my first thought? And the first words come out of my mouth, I can't help myself. Did you lose him again? My well, wife, think- on the other hand, she's like, uh, yeah, he's tied up in my closet. Plus, do you think you'd want to see all these crosses if he came back? That'd be like Tupac coming back and everybody wearing bullet necklaces, you know? This is for Tupac. Dude was shot. <laughs> yeah, who wants to be remembered how they fucking died? They just want to be loved and welcomed back. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's fine. You know, they worship uh, they worship a symbol of death. It's the center of their belief system, whether they whether they acknowledge that or not. And therefore, it's funny that everything that they do always ends up to the death. The death of their sanity, the death of their emotions, the death of their consciousness. You know, there's not some great demiurge that's, you know, sacrificing them. They're sacrificing themselves to it, you know. And I, I don't know. I don't mean to be so hateful towards it. I'm just being brutally honest about my thoughts on it. And that's all, you know. Yeah. But see, that that's the thing we're not being hateful. We're being more conversational. We're being more, cause I, I, I have family that are Christian. I have friends that are Christian. They know that I make jokes about it. They know that, you know, they make jokes about me all the time. So it, it's pretty mutual. Yeah. Um, but they know that I, I have conversations. They know that, I mean, I've had conversations with them and, uh, the, the thing that people need to realize is you don't have to agree with someone. You don't have to believe as they do to love them. Yeah, because people are just people. Uh, uh, Excuse me. Pardon me. Let me correct this one. People are people as long as they choose to be. You know, right. It's like, for example, you know, I have family that's Christian. I'm as far from Christian as you would ever get. They're respectful as shit to me. You know what? When they sit there and they talk about their God and their Jesus, I let it go because fuck it. You know, they don't judge me. I'm not judging them. You know, I only return fire on fire with Paul. So, you know, I mean, no disrespect to your Christian friends or any viewers out here and they have some, or maybe even we have Christian viewers. You know, it's just, it's, it's a shame when there's so few of you out there who have took upon yourselves to take the to take upon yourselves, as the Buddha said, I have no problem with their God, with their, I have no problem with their Jesus, but I wish his people were more like him. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely right. Spot on. But let's get to your, uh, let's get to your paintings and stuff, man, because I know you, you, you're a bit of a painter. You've been doing this for how many years? Well, painting is actually relatively new. Painting for me has been for the past few months, but I've always been an artist. Like some of my artwork, more of my occult style art. Oh, that reminds, oh, that is so cool. You'll notice some elements in it, like uh, the Egyptian symbol for a pet, uh, Apophis. Yeah. my symbol for Beelzebub that I use in ritual. Oh, that is one hell of a gateway. Oh, that is powerful, brother. You gonna put that in a book or something? No, actually, it's just what I do for the occult. It's just things that I actually use in my practices and, and such. My trapezoid. Oh, hell yeah. Got that twin serpent power going there. Yeah, it, it, and th- these are just some of my drawings that I've done for the occult and that I use. Some of the elements from it I use in paintings. I kind of hide it amidst the painting itself. It'll look like a fairly normal piece, but if you look in specific areas, there's actual occult symbols and symbology. Yeah. Like this one. Oh, wow. Is that... I use the name Ambrogio in the occult, Frederick Ambrogio. 
I'm, I'm more known as Frederick Nagash from the past, but I, I haven't used that name in a very long time since I had dissolved the COL and now I brought it back. I use Ambrogio. And then I do some just regular art with, with pen. Now that is a hell of a fetish, brother. Uh, mind you, I'm, I'm legally blind. I have 15% vision in my right eye and the left eye is gone. So it, it, it's actually Very quite the, uh, man. yeah, it's actually quite the uh, achievement for me anyway, that I can actually do any of this. Well, you know what I'm looking in mind of, uh, if you ever uh, worked uh, uh, Norse magic and stuff, the uh, now I enacted the uh, nine days hung upon the tree, you know, or the however many days was. I'm so sorry if I messed that up. Uh, but the thing with he sacrificed his eye mm -hmm. to gain this knowledge, and I've and I've always thought this was strange that people whose sight starts to go, they they see deeper on a spiritual level, especially if they are magical, if they are, you know on the path and you can definitely tell in your artwork man it's it's crazy because i've never been able to do certain things in art because of my eyes and so i took to using more tools right. i started using measurement tools and things like that um just to do simple art and over the years i've actually gotten really kind of adept at, at doing it that is an awesome dragon dude and uh, I moved from there to more pieces for my books. Wow. And I then mean, just oh, recently, your works of art. Yeah, it, it, it's something that I've always done. I've always done drawing, sketching, things like that. But I've never been able to paint. I was really addicted to Bob Ross as a kid. Okay. I used to watch The Joy of Painting incessantly. And I tried to paint tree right here. Huh? We're going to put a happy little tree right here. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I've always been addicted to Bob Ross. And, and it was like when I was a kid, I tried painting, was never good at it. I gave it up. I got a little older, probably in my 20s. I tried again, wasn't very good at it, gave it up. And now I just turned 40 this year. And uh, I was like, I'm going to give it a go. I have a, a gouache paint set and a acrylic paint set. And I was like, I'm just going to sit down and do it. And lo and behold, it actually has been turning out somewhat decent. Dude, that is awesome. And it was pretty much out of the blue that I could actually do this. Do you ever name them? Does a name or a place ever come to mind when you're doing these? Um, I'm currently using the name Weissfair Art, W-E-I-S-F-I-R, which I actually got the name. A lot of people are like, is that German? Is that Irish? All different things. But it was actually from a magic formula. I took a specific uh, statement of intent, broke it down, and I got Weissfair out of it. And... Uh, I don't have a Sigil with it or anything like that. I just needed the name, the word. Yeah. And so I use Weissfair Art. Well, I did something similar with the uh, chariot card of the tarot years ago. Uh, they were like, you know, you need to make your own, uh, certain spirits I was working with, you know, were telling me, you know, you need to make your own chariot. Okay, well, Gimel is the camel and it represents, you know, the vehicle by which you travel. And I was like, you know, I wanted something that wasn't Abrahamic, that wasn't, you know, Jewish mysticism or anything like that. I wanted something natural on my own. And I thought of a staff automatically, like a straight line from the root to the crown and, and just a constant flux up to where everything I did was all for the evolution of self, all for the ascension of self and the consciousness. And, uh, and I came up with my own and uh, I got to say it's, it's, I, I see where that came from and how that would work like that. So that's kind of cool. But I was talking about like, like that one painting that she showed. D do names come up when you, when you're doing your paintings of things like that? 
Yeah, it, like I was saying with the Black Flame, it, it pretty much is everything. It's in everything that I do. It's applied to pretty much every avenue of, of my life. Yeah. And when I made my first couple paintings, my girlfriend at the, right now, is she was like, that, that's amazing. You did that? I was horrible at painting my entire life to the point where I was just like, I will never f understand this. I give up. And that was like three to four times in the past. And uh, it just clicked like a light bulb went off in my head. And uh, I started painting and it actually has turned out fairly decent to the point where I have people actually asking me to do commission work for them to do projects. I was recently asked to do a, a project involving Seagulls with uh, specific paints that are reflective of of light and uh, black lights so that the Seagulls sort of uh, almost pulse out of the picture, yeah. but I'm going to be doing them on wood. Um, so I've been asked to do a lot of things recently and I was like, I'm going to try and sell some of my art and it's, it's actually going fairly well. I was about to ask, do you plan on, you know, commissioning work for people? Because if you do, do let my audience know. Yeah, Weiss Fair Art on, uh, on Facebook. It's, it's the page that we had just started probably less than a week ago. Um, I'm going to be doing prints that are framed panel prints. I'm also going to sell some of the originals because once I have the, the originals scanned in with a high quality scanner, I'll pretty much have them. I'm going to sell the originals. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be making lots more art. Well, I have them in all different sizes too. So, Well, I'm going to be providing a link at the end of this video for that page so that for any of my audience out there who wants right here to do some to do some commissionary work for you. My oh boy here, you got some mad skills. I wish you had Thanks. some painting paintings available that you could just show us, that you like show on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing. It, it, it's, it, it just came out of nowhere, like a lightning bolt just mm -hmm. sort of hit and it made sense. All the, I don't know if it was all the years of Bob Ross subconsciously making happy trees that, that finally hey, this is how I can do trees. This is how I can do this. I don't know what it was actually, but I pretty much got out of paint kit. I got my watercolor pad and I started painting. I have pictures now on watercolor, on canvas, framed canvas, um, canvas panels, all different sizes. Yeah. And uh, it's literally become sort of like a, an obsession almost. Yeah, you know, I think this is funny. When I was 19, I read A Life of Levi Dale. Uh, and he was saying that, you know, that a person shouldn't begin the serious work, or shouldn't, be, shouldn't begin the great work until they're 40. Now, that annoyed the shit out of me at 19 years old. I'm like, bullshit, motherfucker, let me show you. I can do this at 19. And I was like, you know, I was that little cocky motherfucker that, you know, I'm going to show this motherfucker. I don't care if he's dead. I'll show his face. Hey, look what I did. But it's really funny that in the last year and a half, now I just turned 40 back in August, but it started about 39, everything clicked. Like I literally absolutely understood what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. I absolutely understood my will. And the next thing I know, I'm getting on here and I do these videos as part of my true will. Part of my true will is to take these people that people may or may not have heard of that are equally as skillful and just as effective and powerful and just, you know, talented and say, you know, some of the big names, you know, because the, the, the funny thing is, is that, you know, it's not necessarily advertisement. It's not like that. But my true will is to say, hey, Look here, look who we got in our community of occultists and practitioners. We have talented motherfuckers. You don't have to just rely on this big name and that big name. It's all there. And uh, and it's funny that ever since I've been doing this, I have just met cooler and cooler and cooler motherfuckers. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, I hope this don't dry up because I really enjoy talking with these people because they have such unique mentalities and points of view. And I just seem to be growing and learning as you know as they're able to just be like yeah i've been like this forever and a day and oh this is natural this is normal this is me normal i'm sitting there going 
dude, you're the shit. You know, and you're one of those people, and you know, and I appreciate you coming on here doing this with me. Yeah, it was. It's definitely crazy because it was one of those sort of messaged once or twice or commented once or twice on things, and then it was just like instantly click. Yeah. And it, it's been happening more and more the older I get. It, the more and more I understand, the more and more things sort of settle into my brain and, and, and become uh, better understood. Because while things could be understood in the past, it can't be understood until it's truly experienced. And like I turned 40 last July and yeah, it, it's an awakening. And it's not an awakening, you know, like the midlife crisis everybody talks about. It's none of that crap. I'm still it's waiting a, to have mine. I don't know what it's going to be. Hopefully hookers and blow. I don't know. But I'm excited. I'm waiting on it. I'm just every, everybody, blow. everybody says a midlife crisis involves a car. I'm a blind man, so I'm looking forward to driving for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the pedestrians will be looking forward to it, but I'm looking forward to it. Right? You know... Like, me and my wife, we joke around, you know, she, she's like, you know, she's been telling me over the last 15 years we've been married, she says, you are so, she says, you're, she says, you are not like anybody, you're so straight, you know, and she's like, and you're so hard to, you're so hard to buy for and to shop for and, you know, and to get gifts for and all this other stuff, because my attention isn't caught on this, it's just, you know, very, very few things catch my attention, but the things that do catch my attention, you know, I'm weird with, and then we were joking about five years ago where, you know, I was like, you know, I, you know what I'm ready for, babe? And she's like, what? And I was like, my midlife crisis, because I was 35. I'm like, I'm waiting on my midlife crisis. She goes, what do you mean? I was like, because can you imagine how weird and strange and different I am? Can you imagine what kind of midlife crisis I would have? <laughs> you know, it's like you being right in the car. You know what? I want to be the passenger. <laughs> That way I can explain to the officer, sir, you need to be nice to my friend here. He has done nothing wrong. They gave him the license. He got the car. I'm sorry they didn't realize he can't see that well. <laughs> it's like it, when my midlife crisis hits, I'm looking forward to driving. I want to, I'm on a boat. I want to go like out on a boat in the middle of the water. I'll just have a big sign on the front that says, get the hell out of the way so I don't hurt anybody. <laughs> Well, at least you're being thoughtful and kind. You're thinking about yeah. it. The reason why I said I'll be your passenger is so everybody be like, turn left, bro. Bro, right, left. <laughs> you could be the navigator. Damn right. I'm the fucking <laughs> navigator. It's like, I wonder how bro would feel if I just didn't tell him he needs to make a quick left. <laughs> Don't worry. If it was a nice ride, I would make sure that you got plenty of head start on it. You know, I'd be like, hey, bro. Here, like three seconds, make a left. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm still waiting for my midlife crisis too. It's like everybody's like around 40, you're going to have a midlife crisis. Well, I'm 40 now, and the only crisis I'm having is I need to rebuild my occult library. <laughs> you know, that's funny. That may honestly, a uh, couple months back, I think it was about four months ago. I got, I, I, I don't know what overcame me. I have not a fucking clue. I don't have a problem with digital copies of books, physical copies of books. But all of a sudden, my mind went straight to my occult library, and I was like, I want a nice occult library, but I want every damn one of them hard back. Every single one of them. I don't want no paperback if I can help. If they only come in paperback, sweet. I'll put it up there, but I want the hardback. Next thing I know, man, it's a thousand dollars and i'm just like holy shit you know but it's yeah. like you know that made me feel good and it wasn't like an addiction you know what i'm saying like i'm not sitting here now going in well i've already got the next book i want which i really do but that's not the point so if that is a midlife crisis you're going to enjoy it oh yeah well for me for my 40th birthday i was asked what i wanted for it from my girl and the only thing that came to mind was I want the false hierarchy of demons by wireless and hardback leather bound. And it, it has all the illustrations in full color and it has world famous artists who have done the illustrations of what all the demons are, are to look like in full color. 
and it's all painted. It's really nice. That that's all I wanted for my birthday. And so yeah, I'm right there with the wanting hardcover editions. Well, let me tell you what I did. I went a little nuts. I was cool with the hardbacks and getting getting a perfected library. But Daddy had a moment. This is where my midlife crisis kicked in hardcore. So, so my man, S. Ben Kane from From the Ashes Publishing, decides he's going to sell out some of his personal one of one of twenty, one of five hundred, one of so much, so on. And I happened to catch his uh, uh, book of smokeless fire. Oh man, if I could have afforded that one of twenty, I would have got it. All I could get was a hardback of the one of five hundred. I was like sold. <laughs> mine, mine. I mean, I jumped on that as soon as I saw it. Mine. And I was like, please say you've not sold that. So I have that sitting in my personal library, and that is my baby. Oh, yeah. Um, S. Ben Cain. I believe it's S. Ben Cain, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to get a copy of that myself, actually. Oh, you don't own a copy of the Book of Smokeless Buck? No, I don't own a copy of it. I also want to get his uh, The Dark Divided Ones book. Thaumiel. Yeah, that's on my list as well. And there's some by Edgar Kerval that I'm re I've been wanting it, but I didn't know if they if they came in English until recently. I think a month ago I got told that, you know, they're in English. I like, so I've been waiting all this time for an English version. They were already English, it's just the title. Yeah. But I feel like a fucking idiot sometimes with the way my brain works. Oh yeah, I'm there with you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Thommy L is definitely the next book on my list. Uh, it's so weird. Uh, Sorcia Renares, I don't know if you know her. Mm -hmm. from yeah. that book. Okay, now she has a book coming out sometime this year that I'm waiting on because it's about the void. And I, if you're into that kind of that kind of magical book i do i'm i'm waiting like there are so many good books that have been being put out the heck of Teddy and i saw that and i was like holy shit well like i said daddy went nuts and spent you know over a thousand dollars on books so it's not like i you know i was like fuck man i have just went through you know the money i could spend on books i you know it's time to slow it down before it becomes an addiction of oh my goodness you know like those people that get they get addicted to the shopping network i'm like I'm addicted to the booking network. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, but if that's all our midlife crisis consists of, we're a step ahead. I think we might survive it. We <laughs> might. <laughs> Unless I actually get a car. That, then it's kind of iffy. <laughs> oh, I know that's a 17, 18 hour drive for me, but I swear I'd probably do it just to be the passenger for at least 30, 45 minutes just to stay. <laughs> I make that trip and be like, I know you didn't expect me, but guess what? I want to ride. <laughs> you might have to take me back to the bus stop or something, but you know, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it's funny because Sorsha is really cool. I didn't know she had a book coming out. I've uh, actually talked with her a few times online, and yeah, that I definitely want to get whatever book she's releasing. Well, uh, She's uh now from the Ashes Publishing has her own uh YouTube channel and stuff where her and Kane talk about it. Uh, she, I have an interview with her where her and I talked about it, and then she's got videos on her channel where she talks about it, so forth and so on. Uh, but yeah, uh, and after all this and stuff, I'll I'll set you up with the links and stuff so that you can so that you can see what it is. Now it's not put up to where you can you know click and order it. You know, there's no pre-order yet or anything like that. But yeah, she definitely does, and you know. We, we try our best, all of us in this community, we try our best to, to support one another, you know, just, you know, advertise, you know, just, and it's not because we're, once again, it's not because we're, we've got a channel set on advertising, no, 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 but it's, it's about, you know, furthering our community, you know, it's about helping one another, you know, the big names aren't the only ones that hold the powerhouse and knowledge and information, you know, that's, that's no different than thinking that the church had all the knowledge of spirit of spirituality. They didn't have, they didn't hold God in a bottle. You know, Absolutely. So, so there's a lot of us out there that are in the middle of putting stuff out, you know, and so forth and so on. 
and you know, it's equally powerful stuff to talk about and to share with the world, you know. So all I'm doing is doing my part of sharing that and also introducing real faces, real names, real personalities to the world so that other people can say, holy crap, okay, cool. Because who knows, man, somebody watching this video might be like, holy shit, you know, I share similar similar belief systems with this guy that, you know, the Black Tower was was interviewing. You don't ever know. I mean, it's just how it works. Yep. You know? Yep. Absolutely. The other thing is when you've reached a certain level in your own understanding of the occult, you learn to respect and, and almost honor other people's um, individual paths. Even if you all started at the same exact thing, the same exact book, even if every single person starts with the same exact book, there's going to be a different end result in their life. There's going to be a different uh, point of growth. But like climbing a mountain, there may be 20 different paths, but they all lead to the same summit. They all lead to the same point at the top. Yeah. And you really start to respect that the, the deeper you you move through your own self-knowledge and your own knowledge of, of the occult world. Yeah. And I think that sometimes with me, what started the whole thing was a uh, pact that I made. I did a year long pact uh, with the uh, spirits of the uh, Necronomicon that I would do the videos on the explaining it because it wasn't enough that I knew it and I understood it, but you know, there are people out there that didn't understand it. So part of my pact is, Hey, I'll do videos on such and such and I'll do this for a year. I didn't ask anything from them, but at the end of the year, you know, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this for you because I need this. And because I stuck with it, it was amazing. The first year was me sticking to my word. The second year was watching it just manifest crazy, like seriously, like that was powerful, quick. Nothing stood in my way. And that was so interesting. But a lot of times a after that, after that pa initial pact agreement, I, I, you know, I came to a decision. I was like, you know, do I continue this or not? And I was like, hell yeah, because I enjoy it. And then I started getting into the thing where, you know, I was like, you know, I want to interview people. I want to, you know, I want to introduce to the to the occult community these different belief systems and you know, so forth and so on, and interviewing people for it, you know. And if they have a service or something, great, you know, we'll we'll talk about it. You know, we'll show it off, we'll showcase it, whatever. But it was never about the advertising. With me, it was about some, you know, hey, meet one of the members of our community, you know, not necessarily the Black Tower or Dark Sorcery or whatever Facebook group, but of the occult community at large. And so, you know, this has been awesome, man. You know, and you, you make the first hat on here that we can talk about Luciferianism. Wow. I'm honored. I'm you know, definitely honored. You know, I didn't expect that when we first started talking, you know, because I had no idea what you're going to talk about, just to be honest. And I mean, we've talked about three or four different things, but the key point of it was Luciferianism. So that was cool. Yeah, it was definitely awesome. I, I really don't, like I was saying uh, to a good friend earlier today who was like, what, you missed my video on, on this, on, you missed my video on this. He also has a channel. I, I really don't have a lot of time in my day. I have four kids. Um, my two sons have are on the autism spectrum, and my daughter is hearing impaired, so we have lots of, of therapies and, and things like that for them. And then I have to have time for my painting and my writing, and I have to have time for my own occult practices. And so it's like I, I don't have a lot of time. So like when you were mentioning Sorsha's book, I'm like, oh, my God, she has a book coming out. That's awesome. She has great people. And, and so it's like, I mean, we just moved. You, you know, we had just moved recently into our house. I don't even have my altar completely set up yet. That That's how back I still am from the last month and a half of moving. Yeah. I'm, I'm in the room, actually, my room with the altar in it right now. And it's like. I look at my altar and it's like, yep, I still need to put this and this. I still need to do this. But it, it's like when, when you're in the occult community, um, it's not all about constantly keeping up with every trend. Yeah. It's about finding yourself and respecting that other people have found them their selves. And doing what you do best. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Becoming yourself more so than becoming what – society or the media that you grew up with or what the church told you to be it's becoming yourself your pure self your true self well fred i'm not gonna lie man 
I know for a matter of fact that you know you went from a place where you were having uh, water water leaking stuff down in your basement to having to be out of there within a certain amount of time to need to find a place big enough for your family and everything worked out just fine dude you have no idea how 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 happy I am for you on a personal level because a lot of people in the occult community, they're you know they're worried about themselves. Me, I look at it in this in just in this sense. If it's a part of the community, and none of us are all Irish, and we're all one large thing, you know, it's important to to push that positive energy towards others, you know, so forth and so on. And you know, and I'm glad I'm glad you got everything in up in order, you know. And dude, I mean, just the fact of the things that you deal with at home and that's just mundane and natural. And the fact that you still find time to not necessarily practice your spirituality, to live your spirituality. That life hasn't got you down, dude. That's a good sign, and that's just fucking awesome, and I'm happy and proud of you, man. You know? Thanks. It, it, was, it was really kind of scary because the pipes underneath our floorboard started leaking into the downstairs. And so our, our landlord was basically like, I have to repair this, which means I have to tear up all your flooring and the ceiling downstairs. So you need to get out. You have 30 days. So it was like, now we have to find, find the ability to get this money because it easily cost us $4,000 to move into this place. And we had to find a place to move to that was still, you know, decent for our kids. And people that could help you. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, it all fell into place. And uh, when it comes to the occult community, we're all, each of us, a microcosm in the greater macrocosm of, of everything. And we're all a cog in this, this spiritual machine, so to speak. Yeah. And see, and that's what I'm saying, you know, that the strength that it takes to keep going, dude, there there are people out there that have it worse than either you or I, you know what I'm saying? And they're honestly trying, they're struggling. But the thing about it is, is that when you're doing your will, when you're doing your true will, for some reason I've noticed, the universe fits it all perfectly in line with your will. And, and you know, you're living proof of that, man. You know, whether you acknowledge that aspect or not, whether you sat there and tinkered with the idea or thought that's too egotistical or whatever, Dude, it's true. You know, you are in, you are in tune with the true will, and, you know, and that's that's a good sign, man. Yeah, I, I've been, I, I have fully acknowledged that that that's a hundred percent, but I didn't always fully acknowledge that. Yeah, I'll I'll be the first to admit that. Yeah, because the first took, thing that comes is fear. Yeah, exactly. Fear. Exactly. I've been on the path for about 30 years now. I was pretty young. I was lucky, even though my mother was a Christian, she was also a hippie. So I was I was really lucky in that respect that she was like, you don't want to go to church, you don't believe in it? Cool, I'm not going to force you into something, but I want you to find something. That, that was her whole thing. And it was like, I, I looked into atheism, and atheism wasn't quite where I was leading yeah. and uh, then I moved into the path itself and that's been for a really long time but I can safely say it easily took me 20 something years to realize that my will is is manifest yeah. it took me a very very long time to to realize that it was my will in play that things weren't coincidental yeah. I got that man well, dude, we are getting to the end of this video, and once again, I wanted to say thank you for this. Is there anything you'd like to say to the audience, you know, guidance or suggestions or just, you know, whatever? Um, first, I'd like to say thanks for having me on. That, that's number one. Number two, to anybody who's listening, if you're struggling, you have to realize one thing about every struggle in this world, and that's from struggle it can either become your strongest, uh, your strongest ar uh, armor that you wear for all your days that makes you impervious to future struggles, or it can destroy you, and that choice is ultimately your own. And to occultists who have manifested their will, acknowledge it, and it will continue to flow. Acknowledge that your will is, is in motion, and acknowledge that you, know, you are a force. 
acknowledge that you are powerful and that's about it that once you have that realization everything is possible oh yeah dude that's well said well spoken to you know i like that you know and you're very welcome you're welcome back anytime if you ever want to come home for any reason whoever just hit me up brother i'd be more than honored to have you on here uh but for all my viewers out there this has been fred and uh, i will provide links and stuff to his art online on facebook so that you can connect with him there and anywhere else that he feels comfortable sharing uh with that being said then though i'd like to wish each and every single one of you peace blessings and power till next time